Welcome to Iceland. I'm here to explore how new technology inspired and powered by nature is helping make the world a better place. Like this radical new technology that can turn carbon dioxide into stone. It's kind of magical in a way. Yeah. It's like alchemy. You can really hold climate change in your hand. <laughs> I'll see how algae could change how the world eats. Oh my god. It's so, it's so water. I thought it was going to taste like nothing. <laughs> and I'll discover a new way of looking at farming. It's amazing how perfect it looks. Looks like a piece of art. I'm Tom Goodwin, a writer and speaker about technology and the changing world. And I'm here to meet pioneers challenging conventions and exploring the boundaries at what feels like the edge of the world. Iceland, there's no place on the planet where the natural world feels so dominant. Its unique natural characteristics make it a hotbed of innovation. I'm starting my visit at a farm that looks more like a microchip factory, where you get clean before entering, not after a long day in the fields. It's odd coming in here because this is a greenhouse, but you've blocked out the light. Vertical farming is about controlling all the aspects uh, of the growing with great precision. So lights, temperature, irrigation, it's controlled to fine detail uh, and it's the same every day throughout the year. So you get quality and consistency that you haven't really seen before in agriculture. Andre Bjorn Gunnarsson is the founder and CEO of Vaxa Farms. It's a very different way to think about farming. For so long, farming has been about not controlling the elements, because you couldn't, but ensuring you could respond to the elements and dealing with that variability. It does look a little bit more like a lab as opposed right. to as opposed to a, a field. In my opinion, it's a revolution. Now you can take this old industry, you take all these things out of the equation and you can start looking at it from a, a different point of view. We've been growing crops inside for years using artificial light, but vertical farming is wildly different. It's more like maths or design than agriculture with no soil and no sunlight. Hundreds of different variables from light and water to airflow are precisely controlled to speed up growth and maximize nutrition. We've got some mustard, baby leaf, there's red crispy lettuce. Vertical farms also use virtually no pesticides, save vast amounts of water and take up less land than traditional farming, meaning farms can be in cities. Yeah. All made possible by the move to LED lights. The difference between LED grow lights and traditional greenhouse lights is that basically make a light that gives only uh, the light that plants use to grow. So nothing goes to waste, they use a lot less energy and you can actually keep them a lot closer to the plants so you can stack them up. And why are you doing this in Iceland of all places? Because we can't really grow anything here. Iceland also, it's a good place to develop a technology uh, required for vertical farming. Uh, all our energy is from renewable resources. We've got plenty of water, not a lot of sunlight, and a lot of imports. And is the idea that every dwelling would have their own vertical farm, or how does this kind of expand beyond here? There are a couple of different sort of approaches to the technology, ranging from growing inside the supermarket to growing in smaller containers or facilities that are more spread around to something closer to this. For example, um, in Europe, the majority of these things are grown in southern Spain and, and Italy. So they're transported either by plane or trucks across Europe. The whole thing about vertical farming is growing food close to the market and using the resources efficiently. Vertical farming uses a lot more energy than traditional methods, but when paired with renewable sources, it can be a sustainable solution. It makes perfect sense here in Iceland, where more than 99% of their energy is already renewable and where a lot of fresh food is imported. One of these. One of the challenges ahead is making vertical farming economically viable for growing other crops, which could be done by reducing its high labor costs through scale or automation. It's getting quite full now. <laughs> As renewable energy becomes more widespread and climate change makes traditional farming more unpredictable, 
We need to be exploring alternatives like this to ensure we can feed the world's growing population. The work done here will be invaluable in allowing this technology to spread across the world and with it more fresh, nutritious food grown locally with less waste. And what if we could take this a step further? What if we're not just reducing the carbon footprint of our food, what if food could actively be removing CO2 from the atmosphere? Christian Hauflitsen is the founder and CEO of tech firm Vaxa Impact Nutrition. It's an energy to food platform that uses electricity to rapidly and efficiently grow microalgae, aquatic plant-like organisms rich in omega-3 and proteins. This is tomorrow's way of making food. These production units are, are, are a platform that can grow multiple types of algae. So we're going to start eating algae, or well, is it used as an ingredient in other food? We're going to use that as ingredients to other food. You can, you can look at this as, let's say, soy crop, soybean crop. You don't like, necessarily eat the soybean itself, but you eat soy protein all the time. This is far more like a tech company than a farm. By using machine learning to automate and optimize, Vaxa needs less than 1% of the freshwater and land footprint of traditional algae farming. This efficiency combined with its nutritional benefits are getting microalgae global attention for its potential in food and animal feed. So why are the lights um, red and blue here? The reason plants are green is because they don't use the green spectrum of the sunlight at all. They reflect it. That's why you see green. We know that this particular algae likes blue and red light. So what do we give them? Blue and red light. So we are saving on energy costs. So we're not creating white light that has a lot of different spectrums of colors of light. We are only using LEDs that create the exact light or the, the exact wavelength that this algae needs to be as efficient as possible in binding CO2 and water in biomass using this energy. This process is carbon negative. We fix more carbon in our biomass than is produced making the energy that we use in the, in the process. Why is this so helpful for the future? What's the benefit of growing food this way? When we are trying to optimize and make agricultural systems better, we're always talking about 5% increase or 10% increase. But for us to be able to feed the population, we need to, to totally decouple the way we think about food and put something else in the equation. The idea is for the E2F platform to be one of the solutions to fight the global food crisis. Algae has potential that seems nothing short of miraculous. Not only can it be used in food and feed, it can be a natural polymer in 3D printing. It's one of the most promising biofuels. And as we've seen here, when it grows, it removes more CO2 from the atmosphere than it emits. But this isn't the only innovation removing CO2 from the air in Iceland. I travelled outside Reykjavik to meet Dr. Sandra Osk, head of CO2 mineral storage for Carbfix. So what exactly is Carbfix? What does it do? Carbfix uh, has developed a method to store CO2 uh, deep underground as solid carbonate minerals. So essentially turn CO2 into stone uh, to prevent it from affecting our atmosphere. And when you say it turns carbon dioxide into stone, you're actually creating new stone? Is it a different type of stone? Essentially, these volcanic rocks are kind of like, like Swiss cheese. Uh, and what we do is that we dissolve the CO2 in water, and that's what's happening here. Uh, this is essentially just a soda stream machine, <laughs> just a quite big one. <laughs> and we dissolve the CO2 in water, and the, then we pump it deep into the bedrock where it streams through these pores and fractures, uh, reacts with the metals that are within the rock, and then it forms minerals within the pore space. It's actually nature's way of storing CO2. So we are 
essentially accelerating uh, what nature does to regulate the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Iceland's volcanic bedrock has a huge capacity for storing CO2. Carbfix says that the global storage potential is enough to capture the emissions from burning all remaining fossil fuels on Earth. Here we are located next to a source of CO2, yeah. and that's the mo most economically feasible way of, of capturing and storing CO2. If you have suitable rocks next door, other solutions is to transport the CO2, and this is actually something uh, that will be done you know, on a great scale in the coming years where, where CO2 will be captured from locations where you don't have a suitable storage and transported via ships or trains or trucks or pipelines towards a, a suitable locations where it will be injected. The ideal solution is that Carbfix sets up its technology next to power plants or other high emission sources. The rock needed to store the CO2 basalt is one of the most common rocks on Earth. But finding that perfect combination of the right CO2 source on top of the right bedrock makes scaling this up a challenge. So the alternative solution is to compress and then ship CO2 from around the world back to Iceland to be stored, making this carb fix plant a global hub for carbon storage. So Iceland can contribute worldwide by offering the volcanic rocks that we have in abundance and, and build up these hubs where we can actually just import CO2. It, it sounds very sci-fi, but if you think about it in terms of the oil distribution systems that we have built up throughout the years, it's, it's more or less the same. Now we just have to do the, the other way around uh, and shift the CO2 to a storage location and, and Iceland could be one of those. I mean, to what extent is this the solution to climate change? We have to start cutting our emissions and we have to decarbonize our energy systems. We have to recycle materials in much better way. We have to consume much less. So we, we really have to change our way of living. But in addition to that, we have to depend on carbon storage solutions. And this will be for CO2 emissions that we cannot avoid. So this solution has to be developed and demonstrated and scaled up uh, in addition to all of the other solutions that we need. Iceland is in a unique position with near endless electricity, heat on tap and other economic oddities which allow experiments to turn into businesses and possibilities into solutions. But it would be wrong to dismiss the huge leaps in progress here as solely results of the environment or as an outlier. This is actually CO2. Iceland is one of the world's greatest innovation labs, a country battling the elements and the odds, pushing to explore the possibilities at the fringe. It's a country of pioneers perfecting bold, unique solutions they hope to someday spread around the world to change the future for all.